I want to say welcome. Um, this is the webinar series from the Ioneer Foundation called Sight and Sound Bites. Uh, this biweekly webinar series highlights research at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Today, you're going to hear about research in some other universities as well, because uh, we're going to be talking about um, a special symposium that was held here um, with people from across the country, across the world. So um, today's uh, uh, presentation is um, update on optic nerve regeneration progress. And uh, we, um, uh, I'll get to the presentation of the presenters here in just a little bit. Um, I'm Lawton Snyder, CEO of the Ioneer Foundation. The Ioneer Foundation supports research to advance care for vision, hearing, balance, voice, and cancers of the head and neck at the two world-renowned departments of ophthalmology and otolaryngology at the University of Pittsburgh. The funds we provide from the Ioneer Foundation to support research are only made possible because of philanthropic support. And um, obviously for those who have helped us in that way, we are greatly appreciative. So just some housekeeping uh, for today. Um, we disable chat. So if you like to chat during a webinar, you won't be able to do that today. Uh, the Q&A function, however, is open and we want you to use that for any questions. You can type questions at any time during the webinar but we will get to those questions at the end. Um, and then uh, if we don't get to all the questions by the end of the webinar, we also um, make sure that we answer them via email following uh, this, as this webinar will end promptly at one o'clock. Please refrain from asking any personal health questions um, as that may not be interesting to the rest of the audience. We do hold those and again, get back to you after the webinar. Please feel free to use the um, subtitle function for closed captioning. And uh, we will add uh, everybody onto our mailing list for future webinars. Just let us know if that's not of interest to you. So um, we we did have um, three presenters on today's schedule. I'll, um, I'll let you know right off the bat that uh, Dr. John Ash, unfortunately, is uh, unavailable because he's taking care of some family matters. We're all, we're all thinking of him today. Uh, but uh, uh, you will hear from um, Dr. Jose Elaine Sahel. He's our, of course, our distinguished professor and chairman of ophthalmology at the Ioneer and, and Ioneer Foundation Endowed Chair at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. And he's uh, the director of the UPMC Vision Institute and is the exceptional class professor at Sorbonne University in Paris. Um, you're also going to hear from Dr. Larry Benevitz. Dr. Benevitz is um, the co director of the Louis J. Fox Center for Vision Restoration and professor of ophthalmology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, also professor of neurosurgery and ophthalmology at Harvard Medical School and uh, neurosurgical uh, um, innovation and research and professor at Boston Children's Hospital. Um, thank you both. And um, and Dr. Benevitz, you know, it's, it's a pleasure to do this. First time we've had you for a webinar mm -hmm. and uh, we're certainly excited about the, this particular topic. Uh, we really feel, you know, we we are very dedicated to this here at the University of Pittsburgh, and um, and so much so that, you know, uh, we 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 asked a, you, a friend, to uh, help us with our uh, research, as you were, you know, certainly one of the leading experts in this field. So um, uh, this is all around what we call the Lewis J. Fox Center for Vision Restoration. I'm very pleased to have known over uh, the 14 years that I've been here at the Ioneer Foundation, Lewis and Dorothy Fox. Uh, Lewis and Dorothy Fox are um, the ben the major benefactors of the Ioneer Foundation, which was established in 2009. Um, and uh, you'll see in the picture here in the very bottom right, uh, the, the Fox Center team that we have uh, assembled here at the University of Pittsburgh. Of course, Dr. Sahel, uh, Dr. Benevitz, uh, going from left to right, Dr. Benevitz, there's Dorothy Fox, Lewis Fox, Dr. Sahel and John Ash, and then Taka Kuwajima, uh, Kunche uh, Chang, and uh, Isam Aldiri are all of the um, esteemed researchers and scientists at the Fox Center. And then on the top picture is the picture of the people who participated in, in the seminar that took place on October 10th and 11th. It was the 13th annual seminar for the Fox Center um, uh, Symposium, and it really focuses on research for optic nerve regeneration uh, and giving progress updates to each other, but also to establish collaborations. And really that has been the key factor of this symposium. And uh, we feel very, very important to the success 
of this incredibly big challenge of regenerating the optic nerve. So uh, to get into what it's going to take and where we are and give you that update, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Benevitz. Okay, great. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Lonnie. And um, um, I wish I were able to see the, uh, the, the audience. Uh, we're not set up that way today. But um, I'm, I'm delighted to be presenting. Uh, there's so much material that was covered in the conference. Um, I, I'm trying to reach a balance between um, sort of conveying the richness, uh, the depth, um, kind of the uh, the marvelous science of what was presented, but um, not 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 in too much detail. Um, but we be, will be very happy, of course, to uh, to fill in if people have questions about the work. So the place to start, of course, is the eye, uh, where all vision begins. And uh, as you know, uh, light comes in through the front of the eye, uh, is focused in the back of the eye onto the retina. Uh, light actually passes right through the, uh, the uh, integrating um, cells, the retinal ganglion cells that are going to be the main focus of this work. Uh, light passes right through them uh, and activates the photoreceptors uh, in, the, uh, in, in the back of the retina. So that's, uh, let's see if I can get the, uh, the pointer working here. Uh, okay, so here we have the photoreceptors over here. Uh, then through a, an extraordinary complex, extraordinarily complex network of other neurons, uh, the, the retina is itself a marvelous computational uh, device of extraordinary complexity. So then these intermediate cells, the bipolar cells and Amacrine cells uh, sit over here, and then the cells that we're going to be primarily concerned with are the ones that receive information through the circuit and convey it on to the brain, the retinal ganglion cells um, over here. So the retinal ganglion cells are the output neurons of the, uh, of the eye, and these are the neurons uh, whose nerve fibers uh, connect through the optic nerve, project through the optic nerve, to visual relay centers in the brain. And of course, we know uh, very sadly that if that, uh, that connection is interrupted as a result of traumatic uh, injury or ischemic injury or in neurodegenerative diseases such as glaucoma and several others, there's a permanent loss of vision because the optic nerve does not spontaneously regenerate. So just taking a look at the circuit, here are our eyes. Um, each eye receives information, some information from its own side, the uh, so-called ipsilateral visual field, as well as the contralateral visual field. That all gets sorted up in the central connections. Uh, and so the, re the retinal ganglion cells, these cells over here in this circle, then are the ones that give rise to the optic nerve uh, the optic nerve actually projects to a number of, um, of subcortical uh, visual areas, including, for example, here, the suprachiasmatic nucleus that controls um, uh, circadian activity. All of our body circadian activity is orchestrated through that nucleus. But when we think of image forming vision, that is what we commonly think of as seeing, seeing the world around us, that's the projection from the retina here to this area, the so-called dorsal lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. So that's buried deep below the uh, cerebral cortex. And then the neurons of the dorsal lateral geniculate nucleus in turn send projections on up to our cerebral cortex, which is where conscious vision uh, begins. Uh, and then there's an extraordinary complex a uh, set of relays from the primary visual cortex onto uh, other visual areas. Uh, and that's what underlies our um, kind of knowledge of the visual world. So again, we're thinking, we're talking about the optic nerve here and the inability of the optic nerve, well, the, that's actually the optic tract, the inability of the optic nerve to regenerate when injured. So this uh, summarizes some of the research from my own laboratory. So what we're illustrating schematically over here uh, in an animal model is the, uh, the eye of a, of a mouse or a rat, some uh, attractable uh, animal model. 
Uh, here, we're only illustrating the retinal ganglion cells. We're not showing the other cell types of the retina. And again, the retinal ganglion cells, the nerve fibers, the axons that originate in the retinal ganglion cells, collect and then project to the brain, carrying visual information to these visual, uh, visual relay areas, such as the dorsolateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. So if this pathway is injured, we do this experimentally in animals, the nerve fibers uh, beyond the injury site begin to degenerate. After a bit of time, the cell bodies themselves degenerate, pretty much precluding any possibility for recovery. So uh, this, uh, this image with the green fluorescence is a, a, a kind of a, a histological section through the optic nerve that's been injured um, in a, uh, this happens to be a rat in this case. But what we discovered a number of years ago, um, really quite by accident initially, is in the same situation where we injure the optic nerve, if we activate immune cells, if we cause an inflammatory reaction uh, to occur in the eye, the incoming immune cells surprisingly um, make a host of trophic molecules. They secrete proteins that cause the retinal ganglion cells to switch on their expression of a number of genes that are related to axon growth. And so with that, then these retinal ganglion cells, which again would have normally very, very little uh, capacity to regenerate, now start to regenerate axons beyond the injury site. And that's shown in this histological section uh, over here. And then we discovered, this was reported 11 years ago now, that if we combine uh, this intraocular inflammation with a discovery made by my neighbor at Boston Children's Hospital, uh, Jigong He. His laboratory found another way of promoting regeneration, um, which is removing the uh, kind of breaks, um, so some of the intercellular, intercellular signaling pathway. If you combine these two procedures, you get remarkable synergy. And again, here is a pathway that shows normally no regeneration whatsoever. Here is our injury site here. And now these red fibers that you see coursing through the optic nerve, these are regenerating axons, hundreds of them. Nowhere near enough to restore vision, but it's showing us in principle that if we could optimize the system, we're able to get really appreciable levels of optic nerve regeneration. So this is a higher magnification image of axons extending the full length of the optic nerve just before the point where they uh, cross, uh, many of the axons cross to the contralateral side of the brain. And here in these experiments, uh, some of these nerve fibers uh, knew where to go and connected to the proper um, projection areas in the, the, uh, in the brain. This is the, uh, again, this dorsal lateral geniculate nucleus, which is important for uh, image vision. So what about the cells that are responsible for producing these trophic molecules? Uh, so if we take a closer look at the inflammatory cells, we see that there are two types, neutrophils and macrophages. And uh, after a couple of years of work, we identified the molecules that they make. This is combining several types of biochemistry, cell culture, um, mass spectrometry, uh, a number of techniques led us to identify these molecules that are made by the inflammatory cells which are sufficient to cause the regeneration to mimic the effects of inflammation. This is using one of those molecules together with that um, method discovered by my colleague, but there are a number of manipulations like this that will give us very extensive regeneration. So um, without going into too many details, um, just sort of a, serves as an introduction to some of the uh, other work that was presented um, at the meeting, we can also ask what's going on in the mind, um, facetious, speaking <laughs> humorously, what's going on in the mind uh, of a retinal ganglion cell? So here is a retinal ganglion cell from uh, a picture I was able to find on the web. Uh, this is a retinal ganglion cell, not in its normal position, but taken out uh, and put into cell culture. So if we look closely at what goes on in the retinal ganglion cell, um, the cell surface is covered, of course, by the uh, uh, by a lipid, uh, by a li by lipid uh, membrane. Um, there, we know some of the growth factors, such as oncomodulin. They act through a receptor. A receptor is kind of what conveys the signal of these growth factors into the cell. And the binding of the, um, the growth factor to this receptor initiates a signaling cascade. Um, 
a number of enzymes become activated. And this boils down to activating uh, what are called transcription factors. Transcription factors are proteins that bind to the DNA and determine which parts of the DNA get read out um, uh, is it as a result of some kind of cell signaling or in the baseline state. So over the years, we've identified many of these players, uh, the growth factor oncomodulin. We just recently identified the receptor for it, a protein called RMC10. We've identified some of the intracellular signaling pathways, and we've identified some of the transcription factors that either suppress or activate the growth program. So let's go on to the work of uh, my friend and colleague, Roman Geiger, who's at the University of Michigan. Roman has done more work, uh, very nice work, on how uh, proteins produced by inflammatory cells, produced by immune cells, can promote regeneration. So I'll um, try to go through this, um, kind of try to find the right balance uh, without going into too much, uh, too much detail. But um, you know, imagine yourself going through a museum and looking at a uh, a gallery of um, of paintings, um, and uh, you know, one doesn't uh, can spend different amounts of time on them, or you can just kind of make a quick walkthrough of the gallery. Um, this is going to be more of a quick walkthrough of the gallery. But I'd like like to emphasize that just about every speaker at the last Fox conference was a world leader in, in his or her respective field. So it was really marvelous. We had a wonderful response. Um, just about everybody invited um, attended, and we covered a wide range of topics that are relevant to solving this problem of promoting regeneration. So again, uh, impressionistically, uh, this is Roman's work. Roman has uh, picked up on this topic of how uh, immune cells can produce molecules that promote growth. And uh, I'll just skip to this slide that he sent me uh, <laughs> just uh, this morning. He was at the same conference as I was in Boston for the last two days. But uh, essentially, Roman has done careful characterization of the, of the immune cells that can be induced to enter into the eye. And he has found out that by manipulating these cell populations, putting genes into these cells, taking genes out of these cells, uh, suppressing other kinds of immune cells, he gets this extraordinary amount of regeneration of nerve fibers. So again, this is the optic nerve. This is a longitudinal section of the optic nerve uh, of a mouse in this case. Roman has found a better way of inducing uh, inflammation, uh, kind of um, an improvement of what we had been doing. And he's also done very, uh, very elegant manipulations of these cells to make them um, better producers of growth promoting molecules to promote extensive regeneration. Um, Derek Wellsby is at uh, University of California, San Diego. He worked with Donald Zack, who I'll be mentioning in a moment. Uh, Derek has done amazing work um, screening just about every gene that's, um, that's um, encoded in, in, in our DNA. Um, by using the methods of CRISPR-Cas9. You may have heard about this. Uh, he was able to manipulate one by one every single gene to find ones that are important for the survival of retinal ganglion cells when the optic nerve is injured. I forgot to mention, very importantly, that when the optic nerve is injured, the retinal ganglion cells, the cells in the retina that send their axons through the optic nerve, um, very unfortunately, uh, uh, atrophy and die. Uh, and of course, this is exceedingly irrelevant for diseases such as glaucoma, not just traumatic injury of the optic nerve. So Derek has done heroic work identifying the molecules and the signaling pathways that control the life of death of life or death of retinal ganglion cells, as well as their ability to regenerate axons. So this is just kind of schematically showing the workflow of his uh, of his of his uh, uh, labors. And essentially, he's identified a couple of signaling molecules. These are proteins called protein kinases. They are enzymes that add an active group uh, that activate proteins generally, sometimes inactivate phosphate group. And uh, one protein that he found, uh, when you knock it out, the retinal ganglion cells sh show an amazing ability to survive, not completely, but an immense increase in their ability to survive after the optic nerve is injured 
But unfortunately, if you delete the gene at the same time that you're promoting the survival of retinal ganglion cells, it sadly suppresses their ability to regenerate axons in response to uh, treatments that, that we know would normally promote regeneration. But one big recent advance was the discovery of this uh, enzyme GCK4, which when suppressed uh, in retinal ganglion cells, knocked the gene uh, out using uh, a kind of gene therapy. What he found is that this will both uh, increase the survival of retinal ganglion cells and strongly amplify uh, axon regeneration. So here's our injury site in the optic nerve over here. And after some period of time, maybe two weeks, we're seeing extraordinary levels of regeneration. So this is telling us that we might be able to get the best of both worlds, uh, increasing the survival of retinal ganglion cells when their axons are injured, which incidentally happens in glaucoma, uh, and enabling those cells to regenerate axons. Xin Duan, uh, University of California, San, uh, San Francisco, uh, has been doing wonderful work um, developing genetic tools that let him visualize all the different cell types of the retina. So I should mention that uh, the retina is in, an incredibly complex computational um, uh, organ. And uh, we know in uh, mice, believe it or not, these retinal ganglion cells, these projection neurons, there are more than 40 types of those. Uh, in our retina, there's something like, maybe something in the order of 20. Uh, Dr. Sahel uh, might be able to correct me on that. But the question is, what do each one of these retinal ganglion cells do? They have specialized functions. They often have different physiological response properties to different uh, aspects of the visual scene or to increasing or decreasing light. And they have slightly different connections uh, into the brain. And they're very clever. They know exactly where to connect. And so Xin Duan's work has now enabled us to uh, label all of these different types of retinal ganglion cells and find out what innate, what, uh, where, where they connect, whether during regeneration, different types of retinal ganglion cells are able to form connections to the right parts of the brain. Um, he has uh, worked on identifying molecules that promote regeneration, you know, kind of a, um, a golden chalice for many of us. Um, and uh, then using these labels for these different types of retinal ganglion cells, he's able to trace their connections into the brain during normal development, uh, not, in, not in regeneration, which is hard to achieve. Um, but this is one molecule that he's been studying, uh, a protein called OPN. And here again, in this search for molecules that promote gang the survival of retinal ganglion cells and that promote axon regeneration, uh, this is another home run. And you may be asking yourself, you know, are these unique? Can we put them together and improve over the, uh, over the um, uh, stimulatory ability of these individual molecules? And the answer has generally been yes. Uh, so combinatorial uh, therapies, putting together uh, multiple things that we know about, um, these uh, proteins that are secreted by inflammatory cells, proteins that can be manipulated, um, by gene therapy in the retinal ganglion cells themselves, putting these things together can give us um, really unprecedented levels of regeneration. Uh, here is the work of Taka Kuwajima and Steve Badalak uh, at uh, AUPMC, uh, Department of Ophthalmology. Steve, is, I guess his primary appointment is elsewhere. Taka is in the Department of Ophthalmology. Uh, and they've been working on other methods to promote regeneration. Uh, Taka had previously found that uh, common cardiac uh, medications, statins, um, turn out to promote some level of regeneration of the optic nerve. Uh, we don't quite understand the underlying mechanism. Whereas uh, Dr. Badalak has been working with um, these submicroscopic particles called um, matrix-bound nanovesicles, um, these are secreted by cells, and they carry a lot of genetic information as well as a lot of proteins that um, we're now discovering, not, not myself, but <laughs> the scientists are discovering, carry lots of information, lots of signals from one cell type to another. And the upshot of this study is that putting together a statin plus uh, MBVs, 
um, that uh, Dr. Badalak's work uh, extracts from various sources um, can also, in this, this image over here, um, can also give, um, here we are over here, can also give, so here is, a, we're, we're, we're holding the uh, optic nerve um, vertically, but the injury site is over here with the asterisk is, and all of these axons down here are regenerating past the injury site. So again, you know, we, we don't want to take this for granted because all of this was impossible uh, 20 years ago. In fact, it was thought to be impossible 20 years ago. And there's been an awful lot of progress along these lines. This is Jeff Goldberg, um, uh, kind of a leading authority in ophthalmology, chairman of the Department of Ophthalmology at Stanford, a close colleague of several of us. Uh, Jeff has done many things. He's been uh, working on um, developing retinal ganglion cells from stem cells, but at the most recent Fox meeting, he talked about um, the role of another cell type, non-neuronal cells. Um, we tend to pay attention to the neurons in uh, circuits, but there are other cell types that play immensely important roles in supporting the function of the uh, neurons, um, uh, maintaining their viability, even controlling levels of signaling. So these are uh, cells called astrocytes um, that Jeff has been studying. And uh, there is a multiple types of astrocytes. These are the astrocytes that cover the, um, uh, the innermost uh, retina. They sit over the, uh, the point where the, um, the nerve fibers um, uh, collect and to exit the, uh, to exit the retina. Another very, very prominent type of uh, glial cells, non-neuronal cells, are these so-called uh, Mueller glia. So here in this schematic diagram with our retinal ganglion cells uh, shown up here, these are the retinal ganglion cells here. These Mueller cells are really extraordinary. They extend um, almost the entire length of the retina. This is one Mueller cell. So these are... Um, important in controlling what retinal ganglion cells do and in controlling the whole kind of status of the, uh, of the retina. Uh, and so Jeff has been studying these kinds of glial cells, Mueller cells, as well as the uh, astrocytic cells that are at the point where the fibers leave the retina, uh, the so-called lamina gribosa. There's a rich structure of uh, non-neuronal cells and what Jeff has been studying is how the uh, signaling in astrocytes regulates the well-being of the neuronal cells, regulates the well-being of retinal ganglion cells. He's been uh, paying particular attention to signaling the signaling molecule uh, cyclic AMP um, and how cyclic AMP is selectively um, not just floating around freely in a cell, but connected to specific uh, scaffolds at specific points in the cell, including the uh, uh, the cell nucleus. And he, this point here at this bottom left uh, image is that cyclic AMP connected with particular proteins uh, here at the surface of the uh, cell nucleus um, is doing important signaling that controls the status of the cell, in this case of glial cells, in determining whether the glial cells will be helpful or toxic. Uh, to the retinal ganglion cells. So, you know, uh, I, I hope you're getting the idea how multidimensional this issue is of preserving the retina and getting the nerve cells to regenerate their axons. Uh, this is a kind of um, fun pie in the sky sort of experiment. This is Jen Doolin at the Texas A&M, worked with Mark Tuzinski at, uh, at UC San Diego, uh, doing these amazing studies in the spinal cord. And we thought that for the optic nerve work, we could learn from what people are doing in other parts of the nervous system, including the spinal cord. So here's a schematic illustration of the spinal cord of a, of a rat or a mouse. The spinal cord is cut completely. There's normally no regeneration whatsoever past the injury site. This, of course, is why people become um, paralyzed after spinal cord injury. But what the Tuzinski lab has discovered is if you put a, an implant of embryonic stem cells uh, into the spinal cord, those cells amazingly can regenerate axons over long distances in the spinal cord, something that normally doesn't happen, and they can receive input from upstream neurons 
uh, in uh, either from the cortex, in this case from the midbrain red nucleus, and kind of serve as relays. Of course, they don't have the precise information about like you're moving um, in the cortex, you're, you're executing a command to move your forefinger. These neurons don't know it, but they know that they're receiving some signal and they're sending, sending some signal down the spinal cord. And so the question has been whether you can do this. So that's a, an image from Jen Doolin's work of one of these cell implants. Different cell types are required. And uh, at this last point here is whether this could have any benefit after injury to the optic nerve, whether it would be possible to implant stem cells uh, in the optic nerve to, um, to relay signals. So this is you know, kind of um, very futuristic, but another approach to keep in mind. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I, I need to speed up here, <laughs> there's a lot to cover. Uh, this is our good friend, Don Zach, colleague of uh, several of us. Uh, and uh, Don has done a lot of work, including um, generating retinal ganglion cells from stem cells. So this is one of the things he spoke about at the uh, at this year's Fox uh, Center meeting. Uh, here's an example of a retinal ganglion cell in cell culture, uh, very complex. The cell body sits over here, um, and then you can see extending out from the retinal ganglion cell uh, extensive dendrites uh, and axons, nerve fibers, as well as the kind of antennas of the nerve cell that receive signals. And Don has learned ways to develop retinal ganglion cells, just starting with, um, uh, with undifferentiated stem cells. So the, the, uh, the hope here is that these um, induced stem cells, and in this case, these are human, uh, from human embryonic stem cells, these could actually be made from any cell in the body uh, through genetic manipulations that we discovered a couple of years ago. Don is able to then reconvert these cells into retinal ganglion cells with the hope that these can be used to replace retinal ganglion cells that have died in diseases such as glaucoma or uh, if they're uh, ischemic or traumatic injury to the optic nerve. Uh, Kun Che um, worked with Jeff Goldberg, um, and I mentioned that Jeff Goldberg has also been doing uh, work very similar to Don Zach's of um, of uh, developing retinal ganglion cells, and again, human or mouse retinal ganglion cells from induced pluripotent stem cells. So you can take something like a skin cell, you can treat that skin cell with a number of manipulating these uh, transcription factors to alter its state of gene expression. And then you can, it, you can manipulate those cells in a way that turns them now into real retinal ganglion cells that have uh, many of the electrophysiological properties of retinal ganglion cells, express many of the genes of retinal ganglion cells, and, uh, uh, and this work is advancing very nicely, and Kunche is now um, thinking about the next step of uh, once you've made these cells, how do you get them to integrate into the circuitry of the retina? Uh, Monica Vetter is the uh, chairman of neuroscience at the University of Utah. Uh, she has been working for years in understanding kind of the whole uh, gene expression sequence, um, what genes have to turn on and when in order to generate all the cell types of the retina. So we won't go into details here, but um, it's been very elegant, very important work. And of course, it's also important for programming stem cells to become retinal ganglion cells. But uh, Isam, uh, Isam Aldiri, uh, uh, was trained uh, with Monica, and he's been continuing this work looking at um, ophthalmic uh, ophthalmological diseases. Uh, so this uh, schematically is showing the time course of, of when uh, different types of cells in the retina, again, remember that there are these multiple cell types in the retina. Uh, we've been talking mostly about the retinal ganglion cells, uh, the output neurons of the retina, but there's a whole elaborate sequence of how these cells are born uh, in, in a very uh, stereotyped sequence. So uh, Issam's work has been looking at um, how gene expression is controlled and particularly how it's uh, miscontrolled, how it's uh, incorrectly controlled in a particular, um, in a particular uh, visual disorder, uh, NCRNA disease. Maybe Jose can 
remind me what that stands for. But in any event, uh, patients become blind. Uh, they, they undergo retinal uh, detachment, atrophy of the optic nerve. And Isam's work is trying to understand the molecular basis of what goes wrong and devising ways to correct that. Uh, uh, Dan Goldman at the University of Michigan has been working both in uh, fish as well as mammalian models, trying to um, get cells in the retina, again, going back to these Mueller glial cells, these uh, non-neuronal cells uh, that span the, uh, the width of the retina. It turns out that they have the potential in uh, lower vertebrates like fish to de-differentiate, to kind of lose their uh, normal program of gene expression and revert to be able to make other cell types of the retina. So um, recently, another one of our colleagues, uh, Tom Ray, uh, who's at the University of Washington, showed that even in a mammal, you can get Mueller cells to make the interneurons of the retina, the, uh, the amacrine cells and the bipolar cells. So that's a big deal. But what we really would like to do is to figure out how to get these cells to make retinal ganglion cells. This is something that can happen uh, spontaneously in zebrafish. It turns out that we have somehow lost that ability. It would be wonderful if we could do that. And Dan has been uh, a world leader in studying the molecular mechanisms, the switches in gene expression uh, that, that zebrafish use to, to uh, pull off this trick. Uh, and see if we can manipulate the Mueller cells uh, in, the, in the human retina to do the same thing. Um, I'm gonna wind up here, uh, just one or two more slides. This is Yang Hu, who's at the Department of Ophthalmology at Stanford. Yang has developed this um, really nice um, model to develop to, uh, um, to induce glaucoma in a mouse model. Um, he in, uh, injects silicone oil uh, into the anterior chamber of the eye that causes an elevation of intraocular pressure. And as in glaucoma, that results in the death of uh, retinal ganglion cells. And what Young has been able to do is first, uh, the, with he and, um, and uh, Shin, uh, Shin Duan, who I mentioned earlier, have discovered that in this model, while some types of retinal ganglion cells die, other types do not. And so by looking at the molecular differences between the cells that survive and the cells that die, uh, they're now trying to use those molecules to put into the other types of retinal ganglion cells to get the other types of retinal ganglion cells to survive. And to make a long story short, they've succeeded. <laughs> so uh, this is yet another strategy, a very successful strategy. Uh, for promoting uh, survival. So this is the survival of one particular retinal ganglion cell type under normal circumstances. Uh, here's 100% survival. It goes down to something shy of 20% uh, in this glaucoma model. But by putting gene therapy and putting in this uh, the gene encoding this protein that they discovered, they bring survival back up to 80% uh, or so. From you know, from something like uh, something shy of twenty percent. So again, other you know, just wonderful work in devising uh, all the time uh, therapies for optic nerve growth, retinal ganglion cell survival, treatments of glaucoma. Um, this is something learned about the molecular mechanism of this protein. Uh, this particular protein studied here um, helps the transport of mitochondria, the uh, kind of energy packets that have to be transported uh, down the axon and come back up the axon in order to provide the bioenergetics for um, many cellular processes. Um, uh, Meredith Gregory Cassanda is a colleague at Harvard, Mass Eye and Ear, and Meredith has discovered pathways that uh, are very protective, another way of protecting retinal ganglion cells uh, in a glaucoma model. So we're now moving uh, these last couple of slides, um, move past the uh, injury, uh, frank injury to the optic nerve to show how this is uh, relevant to other uh, degenerative diseases of the, uh, of the visual system. And uh, Meredith has discovered that a particular protein called fast ligand uh, has two different forms, a form that's soluble, uh, swims around in the extracellular space, another form that's membrane bound 
And the, it turns out that the balance between these two um, changes whether or not retinal ganglion cells will die in glaucoma. Uh, and um, um, yeah, this extends work that uh, we had done earlier as well um, in how that's related to a different kind of inflammation. This is a deleterious inflammation that happens in glaucoma. Uh, so this is a protein called fast ligand, as I mentioned. And um, using the soluble form, she prevents retinal ganglion cells from dying. Uh, in animal models of glaucoma. Uh, so the hope is that it can also be used to restore function to ganglion cells that um, have uh, uh, have been compromised, but um, haven't died yet, and whether this could have restorative functions as well as um, preventing further loss of retinal ganglion cells. Um, Aaron D'Antonio uh, at Washington University, St. Louis, has made extraordinary discoveries about the molecules that control whether the axon degenerates. Um, he, this is uh, not going to go through the biochemical uh, pathways that he's discovered, but it sort of relates to the bioenergetics and the functioning of mitochondria and um, uh, the formation of oxy oxygen-free radicals. Uh, in the optic nerve, and he's discovered pathways that suppress that from happening. Um, he's formed a company, it's um, sold for uh, many, many, many millions of dollars, uh, because it looks very, very promising as a therapy for ocular diseases. And I'll end here with my colleague, Chin Fei Chen. This is about the issue of uh, the retinal ganglion cells um, extend their projections to the uh, these I was mentioning these central visual areas. And the question is, when the optic nerve is injured or in degenerative diseases, um, is there atrophy of the areas in the brain that they normally connect to? And if there is, if you know if the day comes, when the day comes that can we restore the uh, the growth of the axons, will their target areas be ready to receive them? And so Chin's, Chin Fei's work has been, uh, studying what are the cellular mechanisms that govern the initial formation of connections and how this, um, this so-called plasticity uh, can be restored so that you can manipulate the uh, inputs to the brainstem uh, relay areas of the visual system. So, oh, I'm sorry. And then uh, finally, Sha, uh, Sha Hua P is also in the Department of Ophthalmology, uh, and he has developed just wonderful um, uh, forms of, um, of computed uh, tomography, optical, I'm sorry, optical coherence tomography, OCT, uh, with extraordinary levels of resolution um, to visualize the structures of the retina. So maybe Jose can say more about that and more about this item that was just in the news. So. Um, I'll now pass this on to Dr. Sahel to tell you about uh, this potentially exciting um, development. Um, Jose? Well, thank you, Larry. Thank you also for covering. Uh, it was a very dense meeting with uh, amazing changes in the field over the past few years, and you have been a, a leader. And we are very fortunate now that you are co-leading the Fox Center in Pittsburgh, uh, helping us to develop this strategy, because clearly there is a lot of promise. So this came uh, yesterday as a press release from uh, New York University at Langone. Uh, the patient had been operated six months earlier. So we knew about that. There was already uh, information and some of us actually had been uh, supporting some of her work indirectly, uh, some groups in Pittsburgh especially. But uh, importantly, this shows uh, what we knew already that uh, the microsurgery behind uh, eye transplantation has made a lot of progress. And uh, this uh, surgery has been led by plastic surgeon. Uh, many years ago in Pittsburgh, B.J. Grant uh, and one of his uh, students, Kia Washington, had started to work on that with support from the Department of Defense. And in animal models, it was possible to reconnect the vessels and to show that there was some level of viability. But as we uh, heard about this news and this uh, attempt to, to transplant the eye, 
Uh, there were several comments that can be made at this stage uh, that emphasize the importance of optic nerve regeneration. First of all, uh, this was part of the transplant of the face also. So the immunosuppression and the complexity of the surgery was already something that had to be implemented in this patient. So it was not just the eye that had to be transplanted, but much more than that in this patient would lost a part of his face. Uh, so the immunosuppression anyway had to be attempted. The microsurgery um, seems that it has been very successful in terms of uh, connecting the vessels and uh, they, there is no evidence for any function at this stage, but obviously uh, this would be amazing news. We are all thinking that uh, Although we have made a lot of progress in the regeneration of the optic nerve, this is the, still the major frontier. So the, the patient could recover some level of vision if connectivity between the eye and the brain can be enhanced. And a lot of the research that Larry was showing to you is really going to be extremely important in the future. So we don't know if this individual patient is going to benefit, but first, certainly this is a milestone showing that the surgery is possible the uh, tolerance of the eye is uh, is apparently appropriate and and, okay, and acceptable but uh, restoring function will rely on both regenerating the optic nerve and also i insist, insisted on that when i was interviewed the uh, important element is also the cornea that needs to be innovated so there are many elements of basic science and this is where the convergence between supporting basic science and uh, moving the field forward someday leads to a breakthrough that can be important. So maybe not for this individual patient, but it is an important milestone on the path towards vision restoration. And the Fox Center is all about that. It's really trying to reconnect the eye and the brain and helping this patient that had no hope and still are looking forward to see a therapy coming to them. Thank you all. Yes, thank you. Thank you both. Um, that was uh, quite an overview, and, and it just gives you an impression of just how much work is going on in the field and how complex it is, truly. Um, folks, this is the equivalent, and it's you know even probably more complex than putting a man on the moon. I mean, that's what it takes, is that kind of effort and that kind of collaboration and that kind of piecing together of all these different types of technologies. So it's really exciting to see every year that we do the Fox Center Symposiums, how some of those things are coming together. And Dr. Benevitz, that was quite the overview. It's an awful lot of work um, that's going on. And, and uh, it was nice to hear you uh, review it all. So just a few, we have a lot of questions. Um, I'm going to get to those now. And as I said before, if I don't get your question, maybe because um, it'd be better to answer it one-on-one uh, -on -one with you, is it maybe a more personal question about your health? Or, um, you know, if we, if we do run out of time, we will make sure we answer those. Um, and But I think we have time to get these in. Um, if someone has optic nerve injury, does it, uh, is it going to matter how much time has elapsed before initiation of some of these procedures? Is that something that we have a good handle on? Um, well, the, the answer is that um, it, it does matter. Um, so with the passage of time, the, uh, the atrophy of the retinal ganglion cells will uh, will continue, um, and those cells will be lost. But the hope is that <clears throat> if we at least have strong neuroprotective uh, uh, procedures, that is ways of keeping the ganglion cells from dying after the optic nerve is injured, then even if we don't have great uh, um, mature uh, methods to promote regeneration, the ganglion cells will still be there for the future. So it turns out through some of these discoveries from uh, from Derek Wellsby, um, from uh, a group at uh, Mount Sinai Medical Center um, that uh, both Dr. Goldberg and I have tested in our labs. It works. Uh, it's possible to get very long-term protection of the retinal ganglion cells. So the retinal ganglion cells will not, they, they, can, be, they can be protected from atrophying after the optic nerve, after their axons are injured. Remember, normally they 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 would they would die eventually, but now it's possible to protect them. So as we develop better and better ways of promoting regeneration, the idea was to put together these strong neuroprotective uh, strategies with the pro-regenerative strategies. So yes, the time matters now, and we're hoping that it'll matter less. You know, when we begin to implement these neuroprotective uh, strategies. 
Yeah, that's absolutely true. Uh, another element is that there is a level of scarring after the injury. Some, uh, prof the, Larry was mentioning the glial cells, uh, there could be some proliferation of these and it could become a barrier for regeneration. So time matters certainly, but controlling the neuroprotection, controlling also the reaction of the tissue would be an important parameter. And uh, actually in this, uh, for this patient, we just discussed the, the eye transplant. They have not not been waiting too long. Actually, the injury occurred only a, a year and a half ago, and they tried to, to expedite as much as they could, which is, I think is very smart, but obviously uh, the shortest that would be the better. Thank you both. Um, if uh, we're looking at something that's more, um, you know, genetic or, or you know, uh, their birth related to underdevelopment of an optic nerve, mm -hmm. uh, would these potentially uh, therapies potentially help that uh, those individuals as well? Well, so in theory, possibly yes. Uh, we we are really currently uh, focusing on uh, regenerating the optic nerve in people who got an injury, something where the optic nerve was functional, the connection between the eye and the brain was present, and uh, something happened uh, which. Uh, maybe someday will be fixed. Uh, in congenital development, there might be many other issues, including the fact that the visual pathway up to the brain may not have developed properly uh, for various reasons. Uh, one of these being uh, what we call ambioplia, that uh, if there is no good stimulation of the brain in the early days of, in the year, years of life, then the, the ability of the brain to process the information might be impaired. But on top of that, in a situation where the development has not occurred properly, even the visual pathway itself could be defective. So I don't think there is a one general answer to that. It might really depend on the condition. And there, actually now we have a very accurate neuroimaging technologies that enable the assessment of uh, how many fibers are remaining and the connectivity of our techniques to, to see the connection of neurons within the brain. Uh, so for each individual situation, there might be a different answer, but at least there are two of these issues that are very important, the development of a visual pathway and the plasticity of a cortex that requires stimulation in the early years of life. Mm -hmm. I, I see the next couple of questions, which are, you know, uh, really what I call the million dollar question. I'm sure why many people jumped on to this webinar today. How close are we if we were going to be thinking about um, the potential of a clinical trial? Is there any way we could give um, an estimation on that? Um, Jose, do you want to... Um... Well, yeah, so if, yeah, the classical answer we give, which is uh, in some ways wrong, is uh, a couple of years, several years, but uh, this is very imprecise. What we see is that some of the uh, methods that were show, displayed by Larry today are very promising, and some of them look quite safe, actually. They don't look that they could uh, induce a lot of damage, so potentially this could be... Uh, promote it towards a preclinical. Before you would get into patient, you would need to show the safety and the reproducibility of the methods in, in uh, other species uh, closer to humans like primates. So this is probably the stage where we are for some of these approaches, but there are many unanswered questions. Uh, one of these is being with a number of possibilities, what is the combination that is going to be the right one? And currently the regulatory landscape for combination of therapies is very complex. Usually the FDA, for example, wants you to test each of them individually and then the combination. So you can imagine the complexity of uh, this type of studies. The primary issue is really the safety because you don't want to test in the patient something that may have a benefit that may also have detrimental effects. And then down the road in a few years, there is something better that comes out and then you, you can no longer propose that to the patient because there was some damage or inability. So I think it's it's probably far closer than it was 10 years ago or 15 years ago when the Fox Center was established, but I still think it's a, it's going to be a few more years before we can get into a significant clinical trial, but we are getting there. Thank you. I think... Um... Yeah, just going to add that um, several of the people on... Um, uh, people at Pitt and uh, people elsewhere um, are moving to uh, other animal models now. Uh, and so um, Jeff Goldberg and a, a group that, uh, that, we're, that people at Pitt are working with uh, are using a, um, a so-called mini pig, um, an animal whose visual system is uh, more similar to ours than that of the mouse. And um, we're now, people are thinking also about a, a primate model 
where we can see whether the things that have uh, been discovered in 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 mice um, can can promote regeneration uh, in uh, in something that's that's much closer to us biologically. Thank you. And I think this is an interesting question. How will the development of um, AI and quantum computers change research um, related optic nerve regeneration? Is there any any thoughts? Um, well, let me let me just say that uh, um, Dr. Sahel's group uh, in Paris, with their close colleagues in Switzerland, um, had have developed ways of um, taking the visual information from the outside world and feeding it through a, um, uh, a, a through a computer to deliver signals to the retina in cases where the photoreceptors um, have been lost. Uh, so when the photoreceptors are lost. Uh, the ganglion cells, you know, these output neurons of the retina can still are, are likely to still be there and functioning. And so by making the retinal ganglion cells uh, sensitive to light, some of them actually are sensitive to light uh, under normal conditions that was discovered some 20 years ago. But by putting in uh, genes to make retinal ganglion cells, uh, all retinal ganglion cells sensitive to light, it's possible now to feed information of the visual world into the, uh, into the retinal ganglion cells and restore um, some um, modest level of vision, but it's vision. You know, people can see a uh, very um, uh, well-defined objects against a, uh, a, a white background, for example, that was never possible before. But um, there's also the possibility that um, there can be um, machine learning in taking um, a very degraded uh, visual representation and uh, converting that to um, something that provides uh, much richer information to the brain. So Dr. Sahel has, has been working in this area. So Jose, you want to say something? Yeah, I think the announcement of, of a signal uh, is a very important parameter because we, even if you restore uh, some level of vision, the complexity of a visual system is such that you won't be able to restore the full complexity. So you need to use computerized approach that can be outsourced, I would say, to an outside computer to enhance the signal, to improve the resolution, and to mimic part of what the visual system is doing. So that this way you can have a combination of a biological approach while you are regenerating the connectivity, and then you use, you use whatever is restored to the patient and uh, to enhance the signal and to help enable the ability for patient to regain some level of autonomy. So it's really a combination of the two. Okay, we probably have just time for a couple more questions. We actually have a ton of questions. So we will, as I will repeat, we will um, make sure we get to those and we'll try to do that uh, via email. Uh, but I know that this is something a lot of people ask all the time, Dr. Sahel and and, uh, and Dr. Benevitz. Any insight into the electrical stimulation of the optic nerve, such as they do in, in um, uh, clinics in Germany and so forth? Well, I think there are two sides to the to the question. One is there is some solid science. Andy Uberman at Stanford that showed years ago that her stimulation, visual stimulation was an important and the potential electrical stimulation was a good way to enhance some level of regeneration. But then there have been a lot of people proposing uh, protocols to uh, st stimulate electrically uh, regeneration of the optic nerve. The evidence as of today is not very strong, I would say. There, are, there might be anecdotal cases where some improvement has been observed. Some careful studies have been conducted, but there is no conclusive answer to that. The only good thing about it, it doesn't look dangerous, uh, but I, I don't, I'm not really convinced that as of today, this has shown any clinically relevant and demonstrable benefit in patients. I don't know what Larry thinks about that, but this is my personal impression. Um there had been a lot of enthusiasm about it. Um, I just had an opportunity to, uh, well, review a study, um, and I, I saw a lot of weaknesses in it. So um, the idea is is plausible, but exactly as Dr. Sahel has said, um, the, the evidence isn't 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 so compelling. So I'm going to um, say that we are really uh, very much at the uh, at the end of the program here. We do have a lot of questions, and I also see a lot of our friends. We've had a lot of people over the years who've reached out to us because of the work going on in optic nerve regeneration. Happy to see you on the webinar, and happy to see you asking questions. 
This is a, obviously a very complex topic, uh, but I think what you heard today is that there are many people working on it, and all of those scientists that were, invo were that were involved in this uh, seminar that took place in October are happy to look at ways to work together to collaborate to solve these problems, and that is what it's going to take to be able to get to that to the finish line. We also um, heard, you know, related to uh, potential clinical trials that it's, you know, there's not a real uh, you know, good way to answer that, but uh, that is obviously the goal. And uh, also got some answers related to some of the things that um, that also may play a role in helping people related to these other other therapies and, and technologies that are that are being added to it. Um, we will again get to some of these other questions, and and I think the main one I think everybody wanted to know is how long. And and thank you uh, for listening. Um, we will uh, be back again, of course, to repeat these types of programs. I know this is a topic that will always get a lot of attention, and we are never going to stop working on, on this until, again, we are getting um, answers for you. So uh, thank you for all of your attention, your time, and um, for those who have supported as well. And um, have a wonderful day.